course, I don't need much help anyway, you know. I was actually telling him jokes from the front row over here. <laughs> and enjoying the time that we have together, you know. It's important that we learn how to enjoy time together. Not just coming to church time, but time that we can just have fun. I, I think that there's a serious problem with a lot of people. They don't have enough serious fun. Thank God I'm married to a fun woman, and we enjoy having fun. Well, this morning I'm going to continue a series on the multiplication blessing. Have you been enjoying the teaching on that? If you have missed some of them, you can catch up on or just download on our uh, app, and you can get them for free. Also, um, I believe that we have over 400 people on our app so far. I believe we'll have over 500 by the end of this year. We have 418, Denise. That's pretty good. Well, last week I shared about Abraham and Sarah needing to develop a new identity that connected them to God. Do you see yourself, do you identify with yourself as being connected with God? God changed Abram's name to Abraham, where the predominant sound of God's name could be heard every time someone called his name or he spoke his name, Abraham. And then he changed Sarai to Sarah. So every time they heard their name, they heard their new identity. And it's important that we develop our identity in Christ. That as believers, that we understand that Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That when you get born again, and we're born of the incorruptible seed of God's word, then God is living in us. And just think of how life can change if we had more of a God-inside-mindedness about our life, that God is inside of us. My first uh, point this morning is the multiplication blessing begins in the house. You see, every time they heard their name spoke in their house, they realized God was in the house. And most of what they did was in the house in those days. And it meant they personally identified God was with them. I want you to tell your neighbor, God is with me. The house is the place where the identity is forged. And that can be an amen or an oh me. I don't know about you, but my identity that I had in my natural house wasn't the best. Kind of dysfunctional. I was told I was stupid. I was an idiot. I couldn't do anything. And all my faults and weaknesses were point out, pointed out. There was no real acknowledgement that God was there. I wouldn't have known God or the Holy Spirit if he walked in with a red hat on back then. And God challenged Abraham to walk with before him and be perfect. How would you like God to say that to you? Would you see that as an accusation or an opportunity? You see, he had been following God, but now God gives him this new challenge, walk before me. See, when I'm following you, I can hide things from you. When I'm walking before you, you see everything I'm doing. And that, that can be a good thing, and that can be a challenging thing. You cannot live right with a live wrong identity. I think that's one of the biggest challenges Christians have when they come to Christ is they're still identifying themselves as who they were before they were born again, before the old man died in a watery grave and a new person came out that was created in Christ Jesus. You can't live right with a live wrong identity. Identity comes from the house you were raised in and that's why it's so important to be in God's house so that we can, we can take on our new identity. That's why Abram had to leave his earthly father's house. Have you left your earthly father's house yet? When it comes to your identity. That was the first thing God did. You see, God, this identity issue was on the front burner from the very beginning. He called him out of the identity of his father's house. He called him out of the identity of his father's family. And he called him out of the identity of his father's country. If we could get just some people to be as patriotic to the kingdom of God as they are to the country, we would be doing good. But it, it's hard just to get them patriotic of the country. But how many of you know that we're, this country is not going to come and spread all over the world, but the kingdom of God is? 
Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So Abraham needed an identity change. Why? Because Abram's father, Terah, and his grandfather, Nahor, both served other gods. Now, can you imagine God is calling him to be the father of many nations, and he has a shipwreck of a father and a shipwreck of a grandfather that were not faithful to God? I don't know about you, but when I got married and my first child came along, and my mom had been married several times, and I hadn't really known my natural father, and my stepfather was abusive. And so when I, when I got married, I had, I was like, how can I be a father? I really don't know what it means to be a father. And it came, it came to me that I needed to really be able to develop a relationship with God. Something had to be done about this father thing. Something had to be changed in my identity. And that's why it's so important to have the, the house of God where you can go and connect and relate to other people who are fathers. Other people that have taken on the, a godly identity and persona. Abraham had to had a live wrong identity and he had inherited it from his father and his grandfather's house and now God calls him out to out of the old live wrong into the new live right God given identity. I want you to say this I can't live right unless I identify with living right. And there's even teaching today that absolutely drives me bazonkers because it's teaching people that grace is for, for not living right. Instead of grace being the ability to live right, because God is with us, great, grace is more like a pardon to keep on living like you lived in your, in your old father's house instead of your heavenly father's house. We are living out our behavior or what we believe to be true about ourselves. And that's why it's so critical for that identity to change. The only way that change can really take place is for, for, for there to be an identity change. And that's why we have to give up being the sons and daughters of our old house and become new creatures in Christ, children in God's house. That's why we pray to the Father, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth, in earth. How many of you know we came from the earth? And God wants that, his will to be done in your life. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household, that's an interesting word, household of faith. You see, there's a place where faith resides. It's in God's house. How many of you know you are God's house? He lives in you. Your body is the house you live in. You are a spirit and you have a soul. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God, of the household of God. I, I think there's too many Christians that identify themselves as individuals instead of belonging to God's house. The only way that you can ever really grow up and develop spiritually is if you did like you did as a child, belong to a house. After the flood of Noah, God started over with mankind, and where did it begin? It began in God's house. Noah, God saved Noah in his house. When God saved, he saves through his house. We become members of his house and his family. I think that's one of the most Im important attributes in a church are the people their family. I can tell you for sure we are family because families have conflict. They don't always share. They have to learn how to share. Look at someone and tell them, there's a lot of people that are still learning here. Yeah, you're looking at one of them. It, it really never ceases to amaze me when people say, I can't believe that. They say they did that and they say they're Christians. No, I don't know about you, but you must not have been in the house for very long. But Christians do dumb things don't we? Christians sin, don't we? But we, we made a decision not to live in sin. That's a, big di that's a big difference. And in God's house, people that are living in sin and people that are not living in sin, they, 
they still come to God's house because if there's any hope of us being able to change our behavior, it is here in this place where we learn how to be family and how to be Christ-like. It's not an automatic type of a thing. The Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me and this generation. So why did God choose Noah of all the people on the planet to start restart the human race? And I'll tell you exactly why. His house was in order. There was hope for mankind when there's hope for people in a family who are living right, following God, doing what God wants them to do. It's so sad to see God's people have such little regard to his house and to his sons and their daughters. It's just all about them and Jesus. Well, I got news for you. It's not just you and Jesus. Tag, we're it. You see, we affect one another, and we're here to help one another. Matter of fact, the Bible says if we walk in the light and have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, that, that would tell me that I can't get cleansed from all sin without your help. Then why do we get all upset when someone tries to help us? I don't know about you, but when, when in our house, when our, we have three girls and a boy, so there's four women and two guys in the household. Now, you, you don't think there was ever any conflict, do you? <clears throat> I don't know if all three of the girls, I don't know if they ever all have got along at the same time. And, you know, they would get into conflicts, but in the single-parent home that I came from, Conflict would go on and on and on, and it would never be resolved. But when you're in a house where there's fathers in the house, then the, that conflict is confronted and dealt with and, and reconciled. And I think that's really important for us in God's house to realize that we can't let, that we're having communion today, we cannot let conflicts unresolved go on and on and on and become judgmental and critical with one another. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in, in Corinthians that that's why some of the Christians were no longer alive they died they were judged now to escape judgment later we can't take communion while we have hate in our heart for someone else especially someone in God's house I think it's so important in God's house that we have the liberty to be human and the humility to apologize at times when we are it's so sad to see people that have no regard that how I'm relating with you affects other people and that other people are learning to be just as dysfunctional as me when I won't be healthy and make things right when I get into conflict. You see, we have to realize how important the people in this house are and mostly important are the little ones in the house because they're the ones that need to learn the most. The sons and daughters of God's house, if we don't really appreciate the children in this house, one day they may be our doctors. They may be our lawyers. They may be teachers of our children and grandchildren in school. Or they may be, they may be students that go into schools and shoot people because they didn't learn how to belong into a house where people were transformed and behavior was modeled and and people saw that this is not how you treat people. With the homeschool movement in America, in some ways we've completely abandoned the public realm, and now we wonder why we have such god-awful things happening. And people are getting on the social media and talking about, you know, they want to take your guns, or they, they, they want to carry guns, or they want to... And, and they want to get mad at the police, they want to get mad at NRA, they want to do everything but serve in children's ministry where lives are actually transformed and changed. They want to do everything except for model Christ-likeness to their own kids. Nowadays, kids get in conflict with other kids and the parents jump on the bad bandwagon. And when, somewhere along the line, we have to say, hey, you know, the adults are supposed to uh, be the ones in the room that do something about the conflict instead of joining it. When I was a kid, if I got in trouble in school, when I went home, I got whooped. My, my parents didn't go down to school looking to give the teacher a whooping. 
But nowadays, that, that, that's the way things have become. And, and I think that the only real hope for the schools is for, their, for lights to shine. Thank God we've got some people here that teach in the public schools and they let their light shine and they're not going along with the uh, agenda of darkness, but they're letting their light shine and bringing their light in with them. But I'll tell you, if there's any place that we can do anything about the evils of this world, it's here. Every life we transform becomes a transforming life. You hear so many Christians that don't have time to train the sons and daughters in the house, but they have plenty of time to spend hours of their time on social media talking about all the bad things that are happening because they, people like them didn't take responsibility in the house to raise up the sons and daughters. Oh, it's getting quiet in here, isn't it? The answer is an age-old answer. Well, how can we stop this shooting going on in schools? I don't think that you can stop it. I think that's the wrong question. How can we prepare for it? But in the meantime, how can we change lives that would otherwise do things like that? I think we need to learn how to train up a child in the home, and we need to learn how to train up children in God's house. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast, the confidence and the rejoicing of hope, firm until the end. How many of you remember 9-11? Every one of the terrorists in 9-11 came from somebody's house. And in somebody's house, it was okay to do things like that. And I, I want you to understand something, that that was a terribly difficult time for this country. And George W. Bush did a pretty good job of holding things together, and I know that a war was launched from that, but action was taken and wasn't just ignored. What do you suppose that George Bush, the 43rd president of the United States from 2001 to 2009, what do you think he would do once he got out of office and he'd served, he couldn't serve anymore? He'd been the governor of Texas before that for many terms. Now, I, I think if somebody that, that's handled that kind of situation, I think that when he gets out of office, whatever time he has left, he's probably going to put a premium on it and do what really matters. Let's take a look on this video and see what George W. Bush is doing. Hey there. Yep, it's me, George. Now, before you get all distracted giggling over why I'm making an announcement at your church, listen closely. My fellow Christians, I have a very important announcement. Your church needs volunteers in the children's ministry. I'm telling you, being a children's volunteer is crucial in the battle against the axis of the evil one. How do I know? Ever since I got out of office, Laura and I have been volunteering at Sunday school. I gotta tell you, after eight years in Washington, I thought I'd seen it all. <laughs> but when a toddler starts chewing on your boots while you still got them on, well, you know the Lord's still got more to teach you. <laughs> But no matter what crazy shenanigans they pull, I love these kids. I know some of you out there are scared of them, but I've got a secret. They're more afraid of you than you are of them. Actually, that's not always the case. Last Sunday, little Travis Mitchum nearly rallied the whole class against us. But we got him settled down. How do we do it? Goldfish and Cheerios. Those two snacks are a volunteer's weapon of mass distraction. <laughs> Little Susie wants her mommy. Give her some Cheerios. Whiny Tommy's not paying attention. Bribe him with some gold. Fish. Works like a charm. Don't give him pretzels, though. Those things will kill you. So volunteers, keep up the good work. 
And anyone out there with a phobia for children, get over it and come volunteer for the children's ministry. Help be a kid wrangler for a couple weekends. Even if you can't hog tie him, you still feel like one of God's cowboys. You volunteers know what I mean. I want to leave you with words from Deuteronomy 6. It's in the Bible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. I think the message version would say, love God because he's awesome and no child gets left behind. This is George W. Bush signing off. God bless the United States of America, and God bless all the children's ministry volunteers. Man, I got a kick out of that when I saw that. I think that um, when the ex or previous president of the United States sees the importance of ministering to children, somebody that dealt with the most critically important things every day for eight years, and when he gets out, what does he do? Ministers to children. He knows that's the answer. Every one of the terrorists were children at one time. Everyone that has ever accomplished something great were children at one time. Why is it in the church that so many of God's people have so little regard to their care? I can't figure it out because Jesus said, suffer, suffer not the little ones to come unto me. In other words, don't stop them from coming to me. The, he saw the importance of children. Do we see that? Do we see that God's household is where they're going to learn the things that are going to form their life? You realize that 75% of all Christians became Christians by the time they were 12? Do you realize that people that become Christians later in life don't have the high, as high of a standard as Christians that became Christians as children? Think of it this way. If you're buying a car, the less miles there is on that car, the more miles that car has yet to go. And the ones with the least amount of miles are the little ones here and the young people and the youth. And that's why when we add on to this building, that's going to be the first place where we make improvements. I think as a church, we need to take this on. And I'm not talking about just the, the children in our church. I'm talking about the children in our community. That when we have things like laugh all night and people come and bring their children, people come for, th for a movie nights during the summertime and people come for vacation Bible school and people come for guests that we may have that are here. People come every week. We've had more people that have visited this year in the first six weeks of this year than we did about the first five or six months of last year. I think God is doing something, don't you? Now the question is, are we going to do what God's doing? Or are we going to keep doing what we're doing and asking God to bless it? I made a post on Facebook. I said, don't ask God to bless what you're doing. Ask him what he's blessing and do that instead. God's blessing is upon ministering to children. He came in person first as a child. Our, our mission isn't much different than Abraham's, is it? You see, human beings are the most formative when they're children, and who knows if those that we teach, they may otherwise become school shooters if we don't do our job if we're not there for them. It's important to me as a pastor, as a father, that we're there for our kids. Just like Abraham was there for his. You see, Abraham trained up servants in God's house and armed them for spiritual battle to fulfill their destiny. You don't realize it, but some of the kids here are going to be the ones that are going to be needed for spiritual battle in the days ahead where we're going to have to have people praying and we're going to have to have people that are part of the kingdom's work and what God is doing. And, and with 
Abraham, it says in Genesis 18, 17, and the Lord said, I shall hide from Abraham what I'm doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed of, in him. The King James says, Father, why were 318 willing to go to war for Abraham? I'll tell you exactly why, because he was their father. They were born in his house. He wasn't their biological father, but he took on the responsibility of being the father in his house. You see, Abraham decided to rescue Lot and his family. He responded by mobilizing his house. Listen, if we're going to do what God's called us to do, then let's mobilize our house. Let's get people involved. Let's arm them. Let's make sure they're trained to do what God's called us to do. Abraham had 318 adopted sons as reference to born in his house who were trained or disciplined or discipled. Abraham fathered them before he fathered the child God promised him. Oh, I've got a ministry. God's called me to a ministry. Well, the first ministry is in the house, taking care of those that are in the house. You see, until Abraham practiced on the, those in his house, he never had an heir. In other words, he fathered others, other people's children before he fathered his own child that God would give him supernaturally, Isaac. God chose Abraham for one and one only reason. This was his qualification. He was a great father, but had no children. And he didn't have to have children if there were those in his house. He was going to be the father because that was in him. And so he had 318 sons as reference that were born in his house, trained and in, 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 in disciplined or discipled. You see, there's only one other place where that word that we see trained is used in the scripture. Now, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, the King James Version the word servants is in italics because it doesn't exist in the original Hebrew. In other words, there, there were 318 in his house. In other words, they, they, they were his house. They weren't just hired hands or bondsmen. Those trained in my house would be sons. Abraham took responsibility to train up the sons in his house. Are we taking responsibility to train them up in our house? And, of course, in the New Testament, there's no longer male or female, Jew or Greek, but we're all one in the Spirit. So we're all going to be sons of God, and we're all going to be the bride of Christ. I don't know how that works out, but that's the way God said it would be. Maybe just so it would be fair. I don't know. If you want God to anoint you for ministry, it begins with training the sons and daughters in his house. That's so important for us to see this. If Abraham hadn't been training the children of others born in his house, he never would have been able to conquer the enemy who abducted his nephew, the elder son of his father's house, Lot. He wouldn't have been ready for that. He would not have what he needed when the time came if he had not been a good father in his own house. I'm telling you right now that what God has ahead for us is going to be dependent upon what we are doing with those that he has brought here. Are we... Are they finding fathers in the house? Are they finding people that will help them and train them? That word train, it, there's only one other time that's used in the Bible, and this Hebrew word, and it means, it means to train. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This word is used in reference to children. Now, we know that those that were born in this house had to be children. So we see here that the, the priority and premium that Abraham put on those that were in his house. Listen, if we're going to have the multiplication blessing, God multiplies what we have. God multiplies what we, what we are. And that's why it was so important for the changes to take place. A thousand years before Solomon wrote this scripture, train up a child in the way that he should go, Abraham exemplified it with the 318 that were in his house. Elizar of Damascus was the eldest servant born in Abraham's house. If Abraham did not have any children of his own, this guy would become the inheritor. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house 
is Eliezer of Damascus. Now it's interesting that a lot of people can't figure out what this whole 318 means. But the numeric value of the name Eliezer, 318 actually means God's help. Or helper of God. Same help for Adam and Eve. She was a helpmeet for Adam. He actually is a type of the Holy Spirit. It's the same guy that I believe that later found a bride for Isaac. It just says that he was a servant, but most theologians and scholars think that it's this same guy. Can you see the prophetic picture here of Elijah, the young brother, younger than Lot, because Lot was, was with Abram before any were born in his house, any other servants were there. And Lot was the older brother compared to them. And what do we see here? The younger brother chosen by God to redeem the older brother. God has chosen us to redeem those that he brings into this house. In Jesus' parable about the prodigal son, it's the younger brother that gets the redemption and brings it to the house. Jesus, the second or younger son, redeemed Adam, the first. The first son. The last shall be first. Jacob, the younger brother, received the blessing, and it was supposed to go to the older brother, Esau. We see this played out through Scripture, like God has a way of doing things that's different than the world does. The church received the blessing of the new covenant when the Jews rejected it, and they were under the old covenant, and now we are here to help reach the older brother with the gospel. They were grafted out that we, the younger brothers, could be grafted in, according to the Apostle Paul. They, the Jews, will be grafted back in, according to Scripture, and the younger will reach the older with the gospel. My last point this morning is the multiplication blessing is upon the house that transforms the community. You see, that's what Abraham was doing. He was transforming these young men into powerful servant leaders. There are Isaacs and Ishmaels in every house, and it takes a circumcised father to raise circumcised children. It wasn't until he was circumcised that he was able to produce, reproduce supernaturally. So until Abraham was circumcised, Isaac had not come along. There was something about the cutting away of the unclean flesh that was necessary for God to do the supernatural. How many of you like to see God do the supernatural in here? And look at someone and say, then get out of the flesh. You see, a circumcised father is, is, is a God first father. Abraham, had, he, he put God first. He, he had already received righteousness before he was circumcised, but it wasn't until he was circumcised that he was able to reproduce supernaturally. In other words, there was one thing that Isaac had that Ishmael did not have, and that was he was given life supernaturally by God to a couple too old to have children. It was a supernatural event. And basically what circumcision is, is it's a, it's a physical sign of something God is doing on the inside that he is giving them the ability to live right. So Abraham realizes that in this covenant, in order for him to multiply righteousness to, and for him to have children of righteousness, that there had to be a supernatural work, just like there had to be a supernatural work for Isaac to be born because they were too old to have children. And as soon as Abraham was circumcised, it was within a year, Isaac comes along. Circumcision happened long before the birth of Ishmael and before the birth of Isaac. Ishmael was the child of an uncircumcised father. And what was the result? His name means wild man. I'm going to tell you something. If you father your children in the flesh, you're going to have wild men and women. We need to learn to, to, to be circumcised in our hearts and, and, and father them, counting on God to help us shape them. And mold them. Isaac is the older. Isaac, on the other hand, was a son of a circumcised father, not like the older, whose covenant would pass down to and through him. He was the, the spiritually produced miracle child of a spiritual father. He was the child of the multiplication blessing in whom thy seed shall be called, according to Genesis 21, 12. 
That's the big difference between the two, the two brothers. This gives the descendants of Isaac a more important standing than those of Ishmael forever and ever, and it differentiated the covenant given to Abraham. So Ishmael was not under that same covenant as Isaac was. He had a different father, a father who had been circumcised of the heart. I don't think the circumcised father would have had an Ishmael, but an uncircumcised father would. Why not? She's kind of cute. When his wife brings Hagar and says, if I can't have children, have some with her, he seemed to go right along with it. It didn't take much convincing. Appealing in the flesh. The sons and daughters of God's house are those who are born spiritually, supernaturally transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you see the parallels here in the scripture? The multiplication blessing is how God multiplies righteousness and populates the planet with Christ-likeness. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? What I mean is, is when the church quits living in the flesh and we start following God and walking in the spirit, then God will begin to multiply more spiritual children in the house. Everyone in this house is called to play their part in raising up and training spiritual sons and daughters of the house. It's not the job of the pastors to be fathers of all. It's the opportunity of sons and daughters to take on the fatherless and help God transform them into the children of God's house. It blessed me when we had the baby dedication. We got a little boy who had a lot of energy. And his brother was getting dedicated. And it was good to just see Henry, you know, one of the dads of the house, to come up and kind of assist there. And we need to see more of the men realizing that's our place. It wasn't to go up there and spank the kid. It was to go up there and, hope, and, and hold him and, and show that he cared. I, I really appreciated that. To be a spiritual father, regardless of gender, you have to be one with the father. And that's where in the church it's so important that we have fathers, people that we go to that we know that are following God, that, that we commit ourselves to living a spiritually circumcised life, and that we commit ourselves to walking before God and, and, and not walking in the flesh and living in the flesh. When God blessed Abraham with Isaac, it brought great joy to his life. Raising spiritual children in God's house can bring such joy to our life. I love it when the kids do their musicals and plays and, and they're up here and they're doing things. And, and then you'll have people that say, well, I'm not going because, you know, the kids are doing something. Man, you ought to be up there if you're any kind of spiritual father at all. And you ought to be the one sitting on the front row clapping your hands and say, awesome, good job. These kids are us. And when we're gone, there's the only thing left of us. As I said before, the first place that we're going to expand this facility is going to be for the children and the youth that God is bringing here. You know, maybe you've been more like an orphan on the sidelines and you really need to make God's house your own. It really bothers me sometimes when you see conflict between people and, and some people thinking, well, you know, they, they belong here and I'm new and I don't belong. It's not the way it works. Tell somebody, this is my house. I don't care if you've been here a week or since the church started. This belongs to you and it belongs to God. Maybe God is speaking to you about helping to raise up and train those that are in his house. And maybe you've been taking it all in and maybe now it's time for you to give more of your time, your talent, your treasure and realize that that's, that's where your place is in God's house and that maybe your Isaac's not, not going to come along until you start training the servants in the house. Today we're receiving communion as the family of God and communion is something that we do that reminds us that we are the body of Christ. Christ does not have one in his body. We are many. Being the body of Christ is not something that we can do alone. You see, Jesus invested in himself in every one of us and he expects us to invest in others. Just like the video we saw with John Bevere about how important it is to multiply that that is how God sees faithfulness, is multiplication. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to see multiplication of righteousness, not flesh. And that God has called us here to do that. As we examine our hearts today, I want to ask you to ask yourself a question. Am I investing in those in the body of Christ? As I receive communion today, am I doing my part, not just in the body, but also with my family at home? 
the ones he's given me in the family of God. If not, maybe it's time to commit to changing and, and moving forward. I just don't think that it's what God intends for us to come into God's house as children and stay that way. Somewhere along the line, we have to be fruitful and multiply. Somewhere along the line, we have to recognize we have something valuable to contribute in the lives of others. And God has called us to a place where that can happen. It's called God's house, the church. I'd like us to just bow our heads. And maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I need to start identifying more with God being with me. God, help me change my identity. Help me to see I am a person that God is with. If that's you, would you slip, slip up your hand, Pastor, pray for me. God bless you. Maybe you're here today and you realize you're not really very invested in God's house. Maybe you're not really even connected to God's house. And God's saying, today I want you to make that commitment. I want you to connect, connect with my house, quit being an orphan, and be a son and, or a daughter of the house. If that's you, would you pray for me, Pastor? I need to make that connection. That's so important. God bless you. Any hands going up? Maybe you're here today and, you, and God's speaking to you and say, I want you to start investing your time, your talent, your treasure in my house so that I can multiply my people and transform this community. Is that you? And you say, Pastor, I need, I need to do that. Is that you? Would you slip up your hand? Pastor, pray for me. I need to do that. God bless you. Many, many hands going up. Now let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, as I prepare right now to receive communion, I'm reminded we are the body this is something we're doing together. Forgive me for not doing my part. Forgive me for living life like you're not with me. Come into my life. Help me to walk before you. Help me to circumcise the flesh. Die to the old life. I make a decision today. I'm leaving my father's house my father's family and my father's country and I'm making your house my house your family is my family your country is my country your country is a kingdom help me Lord to make a difference in your kingdom help me to be a multiply a blessing Help me to multiply the gifts and talents you've given to me through the lives of your little ones. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. As we